Hello there, everyone. Welcome to the Feminine Mojo Show here on Blog Talk Radio. I'm your host, Jamie Walters, author and creatrix of IVC and the Feminine Mojo Projects. You'll find more information and inspiration on the Feminine Mojo Projects and reclaiming your own feminine mojo at www.ivysea.com. And um, first, uh, before we get started, we had a little time change here in the uh, United States and perhaps some other places and a little bit of a time change time zone glitch. We, um, but we've uh, sorted it out and John and I have synced up. So uh, we thank you for dancing through the reschedule with us and for joining us now. And as we are seeing, and perhaps as is evidenced even by these little glitches, we're living in and into deeply transformative times. It's something that we hear and we will no doubt continue to hear time and time again. We see it in the news headlines and we see it in the flurry of Earth activities as well. And in the last week, we've shifted into the ninth wave of the Mayan count, according to the work and translations of Carl Johan Kalaman. And the ninth wave invites us further into our reclamation of the feminine and calling the sacred masculine out to play and ultimately moving together and envisioning together and co-creating together into unity consciousness. And we've had Chiron and Uranus ending five- and seven-year cycles and moving into new energies and new expressions recently, too. You'll find a recent blog post on these shifts at my Feminine Mojo and Sophia's children's blogs. And um, you might be feeling these energy shifts as well as seeing evidence of the more global shifts in the news. So we'll continue to have both invitations and the opportunities to shift into our hearts and present moment awareness and co-creation and find new ways of perceiving and orienting. We'll all have the invitation to align with the wisdom and power of our hearts, the feminine and the deep wisdom that each of us has access to. These gifts and practices help us to navigate, vision, co-create and orienteer in the midst of the changes and transformations afoot and their gifts and ways of being and seeing that we've systematically been oriented away from in the patriarchal consumeristic culture. And yet, as we have heard in several of the previous shows, though, we have um, gifts that are part of our divine endowment. So join me in the Feminine Mojo Mystery School to explore the feminine more deeply so you can embody and express it as it wants to express through you. There are already audio programs in the archives on the medial feminine, Persephone and Anana wisdom, Bridget and inspiration, and Circe as she inspires us to weave magic into our everyday way of being and activities, and more. You'll find more in the Feminine Mojo Mystery School and other Feminine Mojo projects, blogs, and resources, again, at www.ivysea.com. And one other reminder before we begin today's conversation, remember that you can download the MP3s for the Feminine Mojo shows as well as listen to the show archives online. You'll find all of those in the Feminine Mojo show archives. So now for today's Feminine Mojo inspired dialogue with John Lamb Lash. If you're listening live and want to call in during the show with questions for John, the number is area code 347-989-1293. That's 347-989-1293, and it's on the Feminine Mojo show page as well if you need a reminder. This is the fourth in our series of conversations about the Sophia Mysteries and the wisdom of the mystery schools, why it's very relevant and timely today. In the first three interviews, which you can find in the Feminine Mojo show archives, John and I talked about the story of Sophia, or Sophia, the mysteries and the wisdom that's so available to us now and valuable what our divine inheritance or endowment is, what those divine gifts are that we've been endowed with, and what gets in the way of our knowing and expressing these gifts, and also an introduction into today's topic, the organic light. And um, in the third of that series, John shared a recap of all of this and introduced us to the concept of the organic light that mystics and sages have spoken about for millennia and from which they received a whole different level of perception and guidance to bring into their world. Today, in this fourth conversation about the Sophia Mysteries, John will be sharing how to perceive and interact with the organic light that provided the mystery adepts and others with divine guidance and a whole different perception and way of being in the world and an awareness uh, that they perhaps had not had direct access to before. If you're not already familiar with John Lamb Lash, if you haven't listened to our other shows or read the Sophia's Children's blog, he's the author of Not in His Image, Gnostic Vision, Sacred Ecology, and the future of belief. 
if you've read and followed Sophia's Children, uh, my blog, or the Feminine Mojo blog, or listened to the first three shows, you'll know this is a must-read book. It's really kind of mind-blowing in the best of ways and expanding in the best of ways. You'll also find John's work and wisdom on metahistory.org and on the Sophia Returning the Path to Planetary Tantra DVD, which you'll find at sacredmysteries.com. John Lash is often called the true successor of Mircea Eliade and the rightful heir of Joseph Campbell. He's a self-educated independent scholar who combines studies and experimental mysticism to teach directive mythology. That means the application of myth to life rather than just its mere interpretation. John's also authored The Seeker's Handbook, Twins and the Double, The Hero, Manhood and Power, and The Quest for the Zodiac. You'll find more about him and his work again at metahistory.org. Welcome back to the Feminine Mojo Show, John. Oh, thank you, Jamie. It's a pleasure to be with you again. It's always, yeah, it's always a pleasure, John. And I know um, thanks, too, for dancing through the, the little time and space glitches, but here we are, and I'm delighted to be uh, joining you and having you join me for another of these really rich conversations on the mysteries and the um, the wisdom uh, that we have available to us now. Uh, so, you know, we, as you know, and, and I know that we've exchanged some emails on this in anticipation of this show as well, we're living in really transformative times where a lot's changing. You know, even recently we witnessed what was uh, going on, historical events in the Middle East as citizens rose up and are rising up to demand something different from the established order. And we've had news of, you know, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes in New Zealand and floods in Australia and and the um, horrific news we woke to here in the United States on Friday morning anyway of the earthquake and tsunami in Japan and uh, the tsunami alerts that kind of woke up the west coast of the United States. But um, these things combined with the kind of combined with the shaking of our long-established institutions, the economic situation, and more reach into the daily lives of so many people who are experiencing really profound changes and fears. So before we dive into our conversation about the organic light, uh, is there wisdom from the mysteries that might offer insight to those who are facing these changes and deep fears in their personal and community lives? I mean, so many of us are are finding it in some way that that's coming up very personally. Um, is there something that the mysteries might guide us with? Well, um, there could be. Um, perhaps not so much in the actual content of the mysteries or uh, perhaps not so much in the, in the nature of the practices and the wisdom that they were developing. Uh, perhaps more in our understanding today of what the mysteries represented. Um, I think if we look back and register in a really uh, clear and profound way what the mysteries represented, that could be very helpful to facing the dangers and threats and uncertainty of the world today. Perhaps I could use a kind of uh, simple parental metaphor. Uh, Take the example of a young child, a, a young girl of three or four years old, and suppose that something happens to her uh, one day while she's at school, at kindergarten, her parents are killed in a, in a uh, car crash, say. Mm -hmm. This young child then has to come to terms with this loss of her connection to the source. Her parents are really the connection to the source of life. She would look to her parents for protection, safety, food, shelter, clothing, uh, and guidance in life, and suddenly these parents are gone. Well, it's crucial to realize that there's a tendency in human beings when they are confronted with very serious loss, such as that, to mm -hmm. fabricate a solution to the loss, to fabricate lies, rather than to face the loss and go on and recover that connection in another way, 
there's a tendency in human beings, as there might be in, in a child subjected to this experience, to fabricate and create things that actually do not heal from the loss, but actually cover up the loss and result in a kind of artificial or false reality being built around that. Mm-hmm. So uh, you might find, as I have found, because I participated for some years in in recovery groups where people came in and honestly and nakedly discussed the traumas and the problems in their lives, no analysis, no judgment, no crosstalk, just people spilling their guts out, sharing their stories. And time and time again, I can tell you that those of us who did that had to confront this difficult truth that instead of facing the loss and considering how to recover it in some other way, how to reconnect with something essential to our existence, we fabricated lies and fantasies around it, around that experience. So I would say that what's happening today is that the the threats and dangers that are coming to us from all directions are making us, forcing us, as it were, back to a reconnection that we lost many generations ago, many millennia ago. We lost this connection to the earth and to the nurturing and guiding power of Sophia, just as a child could have lost its parent in a, in a car accident. Mm-hmm. But instead of coming to terms with that loss, we were not able to do that. A lot of lies and false constructions and fabrications were built around that loss so that we couldn't even understand what had happened to us. Uh, As you know, I belong to, uh, I'm a self-educated scholar, but I do put myself in the tradition of a group of fantastic women scholars. I put myself in in the camp with a group of fantastic women scholars like Maria Gimbutas and Merlin Stone and others who are part of the goddess reclamation. And it's only in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, due to the work of these women scholars, that we have been able to come to terms with what we lost. Now, the good news about the disasters and the fears in the world today is that they can bring us back to what we lost and reconnect us, and we can retrieve it. And through that reconnecting, find the strength and the vision that will lead us through the dangerous times we're in. So there is both uh, a tremendous threat and danger facing us today, but a tremendous promise to reconnect with the source of our life. When life is most at risk, we have the challenge to reconnect with the source of our life. And that is the beauty of this moment. And, And your work and your Feminine Mojo projects and message are a great contribution to this. Thank you for that, John. That means a lot to me. I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, it strikes me, just as I am listening, that um, part of the reason for, you know, it, it strikes sometimes as a visceral fear. So, you know, when there is loss and there is this sort of challenge that is um, beyond us, you know, beyond our personal will, or the desires of our personal ego, you know, we're, we're so often struck with this absolute, you know, panic or terror and, um, and overwhelm. And it occurs to me that part of the reason, if not maybe the reason for that, is this lost heritage um, that we're now recollecting and remembering, but this lost heritage of connection with source and connection with one another and this deeper wisdom that we have access to that would otherwise really help us and will help us to navigate through these things, as you say, with a greater sense of vision and um, inspiration and hopefulness, even as we honestly sit with and hold and have compassion and empathy with one another for the the grieving, for the loss itself. Indeed. I'm really convinced, Jamie, that there are two essential things that will take us, each one of us as individuals, through the crisis. I don't know what's coming. I know it's momentous. I think most of us feel how momentous it is. Yeah. And yet, 
with the fear there is some kind of inspiration coming to us and the inspiration is is equal to the fear and surpassing the fear this is what i feel and as mm -hmm. i try to come to terms with this in my conscious mind my rational mind the same thing comes up for me again and again there are two essential conditions for getting through the catastrophic conditions of our time two essential factors one is that we reconnect with the earth, the powers of the divine feminine, with Gaia Sophia. The problems that we're facing are bigger than any particular individual. They are, they are transhuman and trans-individual in scale. And so you need a transhuman connection to get you through them. And that connection is available. She is reaching toward us in this crisis as much as we are reaching toward her. The second factor that goes along with this divine and supernatural connection, of which I talk about so much, mm -hmm. second factor is healing the gender split between man and woman. Yeah. I swear to you, if we cannot heal this split, if we cannot love each other as equals and come to enjoy and celebrate the beauty of being a man, the beauty of being a woman, whether or not we can satisfy each other's desires, if we can, if we can't, but just to be in that beauty and to celebrate it is an enormous part of the healing process. From that healing of the gender split, which is a big problem why we got into this mess, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's a big problem why patriarchy could assert its power over us and split us and divide us into sexual apartheid. So it's a big part of why patriarchy could have its illusion of power is because the sacred bond between the sexes was broken. When we go back to that, there is tremendous source of courage in that, tremendous mm -hmm. source of courage, and we nurture and support each other in our visions of what a human being is through our genders. That's really amazing, and you know, I, I have written about issues of sacred um, relationship, and you know, it's a re really one of those questions, John. As I know you, and you, I know you know what I mean by this, that rises up within you with a real yearning. I mean, it's more than just a curious intellectual <laughs> question. You know, this whole issue of um, the possibilities of sacred relationship, and as you said, a reclamation of love and respect, and and true revering um, between the genders, it really, fe it does feel to me to be um, kind of beyond important. You know, it's one of those things that seems to be rising up or out of everything to um, call us into inquiry and exploration and, and call us back across that divide. You know, and what you said about the um, patriarchy split and divide us into sa sexual apartheid and broke the sac sacred bond between the genders is incredibly powerful. And, um, you know, I immediately thought, whoop, there's another conversation. <laughs> so, yeah. but that it, it, because it is so important and, and there is such a huge, um, there's so much in that. You know, on one hand, it's, um, it's what it is, you know, repairing or restoring the sacred bond between the genders, understanding how that was split and what the results of that are and, and how we might invite, right. um, you know, healing of that. But be underneath that, the very conversation or, or um, the essence of that, the exploration of that, the adventuring into that is so connected with these other things that we're talking about. You know, I mean, what it kind of um, requires of us or invites out from us is, is a, you know, stepping away from these beliefs that we've been programmed with or habits that are, you know, just resident in the energy patterns of our bodies that really want to be healed and released and updated and changed. So there is a really huge area. And and I know today we're talking organic light. See, this is what happens. You know, we <laughs> have these wonderful conversations and there are so many elements of this that are rich and it's just so exciting to share these with people. So, but I wonder if there's uh, knowing that we can, if we're both amenable, kind of really dive into that in a conversation at another time. But, you know, I'm wondering if there's something in this whole issue of this gender split 
and then this issue of, of um, really restoring the sacred bond between the genders that's linked to what we're talking about today, the organic light. Is there a bridge, or is it um, really kind of a matter of a separate element? No, it's not separate at all, and I think that, of course, that could be another conversation, and I'd like to go back and tell the story of how that split happened, because it's a very specific story took place at a specific time and place in history mm -hmm. in the Middle East with the rise of theocracy. And it has mm -hmm. a lot to do with this mysterious entity, this mysterious mythological figure that we find in the book of Revelation called the Great Whore of Babylon. Mm -hmm. This is a very mysterious, enigmatic figure. Uh, volumes and volumes have been written about the book of Revelation. Many people have tackled the symbolism in that. As far as I'm concerned, they haven't got to it the core of it, unless they can say who the great whore of Babylon is. And this is really a key to what happened to us and what happened, how the sacred bond was, was ruptured and violated. So we're, both, we're doing both at the same time, Jamie. Whenever we talk about the organic light and the mysteries, as we're going to do now, we we'll always have on a parallel track the issue of gender healing. Mm -hmm. Never forget that. I can tell you that I am consider it uh, a privilege and a joy to talk with you about this now for the fourth time. You know, it's sort of as if, what, like, what are we doing here? Uh, Jamie and John are developing one of these long-distance, you know, internet romances, right? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're romancing each other and, and loving each other around this subject. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can tell you that the great joy of this kind of romance, this tantric, guy and tantric romance, is that it's always a menage à trois. Yeah. It's always an arrangement of three parties. So there's you and I romancing the subject of the Sophia and the healing of the genders, but it's not just you and I ever, because there's always a third point in the Gaian romance, and that is the goddess herself. Mm -hmm. And this is the beauty of it. You're not going to be able to advance. No one can advance into the depths of the Gaian Tantra connection and the encounter with the organic light without simultaneously healing the gender split. Mm -hmm. Love is more than personal. Sex is more than personal. When you hold, you as a woman, hold a man in your arms intimately, you are not just holding a man in your arms, that individual. You're holding manhood in your arms. Mm -hmm. And when you recognize that when we love and embrace another person intimately and sexually, we are holding not, I don't hold just a woman, but I hold woman, woman. And this is the return to the source. We return to the source through this gender healing, and we come together into that triangulationship with Sophia, with the divine feminine of the earth. This is how I see it. Yeah, it's it's really amazing because I can feel that. You know, I mean, we're in different parts of the planet and perhaps other people who are listening or will be listening to this um, will feel the truth, the essence, the truth of what you have just shared in our in our bodies, you know, in the heart center, mm -hmm. in in the rush of energy. Um you know, that uh, I know in uh, some tantric yoga path is called, it's um, not the shimmer, it's kind of like that little buzz of energy that you connect first with in all things or in its own mm -hmm. essence. You know, and in the West we mm -hmm. speak only of sexual tantra, and that's wonderful, but there's so much in the tradition that, precedes that in terms of awareness and also includes it. But that's what I'm talking about in hearing the essence and the truth of what you've just shared, I and perhaps others who are listening and perhaps you yourself, you can really feel that come alive throughout your whole body. You know, it moves across your skin and, and um, awakens as sort of a vibration in your heart and you can just feel it rippling, rippling, rippling. So I wanted to share that because... I always like to share with people how we can feel the truth of these things if we're attuned to our bodies and, and noticing what happens 
you know, when we hear something and when, how it feels to us in our body. And that was um, just, uh, it came up so clearly in what you were just sharing. So, well, that's wow. A really good, yeah, <laughs> wow, that's a really good point. And the only knowledge that's going to save us now and show us the way to a sane future to get through these fears and the terrorism of our times, the only knowledge that's going to do that is embodied knowledge. Mm-hmm. And the great the joy of men and women together, or men and men, or women and women, because there are many gender variations, uh, mm-hmm. but, the, but the basic foundation polarity is man and woman. The great joy of that is that um, in that embodiment of love and intimacy, we go into her, we go into her knowledge as embodied spirits and embodied instruments of her. And that is the great, that is our bliss, that's our life, that's our death. That is that is it. That is our Alpha and Omega. <laughs> and it's a, it's an amazing and and very readily available practice ground. I mean, so often I know people might hear some of these concepts. I mean, in their everyday, and um, and it feels very intellectual or esoteric. But the grand point, the gr- the great uh, blessing, and and also you know a really wonderful creative adventure is recognizing that our lives are practice grounds. We can bring those kind of heavenly concepts right down into and through our bodies and and practice it as we go throughout the day, you know, as we interact with one another, as we approach relationship. And um, it makes me think of, you know, I just came across the the, um, awareness of the dark Aphrodite um, cult in ancient times where relationship was, the initiation ground, you know, and so many, there's the temple, there's the cave, um, and in this case, the cauldron of initiation was um, relationship, you know, this conscious love, this coming into this sacred relationship, knowing that you were bringing your spiritual evolution and also having opportunity for spiritual evolution that rippled out, you know, towards one another, uh, rippled out into your community, and kind of elevated everything, so it's, it's an amazing conversation, and it's a conversation that, you know, I'll have any time, any day. So <laughs> I would love to have that conversation with you and share it with um, with our listeners. So thank you for that. And um, if you would, because I know that in these conversations, um, and particularly as we're living into more and more accelerated time and heightened frequency, um, it goes really quickly. So... Let's just, um, we'll turn our attention now to the organic light, and, um, and uh, perhaps if we're both okay with it, we'll, um, we'll make an offering to our listeners to join us again in the, in the Gaian Tantra and um, healing the gender split conversation, because there's clearly so much life and energy and healing and wholeness and love and creative adventure there for everyone. So is that okay with you? Open invitation. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I'm loving it. So, okay, let's just um, take a minute. And I, in the third conversation, John, in this wonderful series, you um, were able to share a little bit about the organic light. And, and I do invite our listeners, if you haven't already, to go back and, and really review and listen to this uh, fantastic series that's unfolding because it really is an introduction to the Sophia Sophia story. Um, the mysteries and the richness and um, wisdom that we can come, bring right into our lives right now. And in the third of those, John did share a little bit about the organic light. But, uh, John, if you wouldn't mind um, just kind of giving a, a summary or a recap now for listeners who might not have listened yet to that one, what is the organic light and what did it mean to the mystery teachers and adepts, you and others? Well, certainly. First, I want to say that I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to speak mm-hmm. about this view and for you to provide me the platform and the occasion to do this. I've written a lot, written a lot about the organic light. Now I begin to speak more about the organic light. Other people are asking me to do so, and okay. you're the first, and I'm really happy to be able to do this. I want to say this... Uh, Two things that would be perhaps helpful to uh, the, the person who has never never heard about this before. First thing is that it's the organic light and seeing the organic light and encountering it, as I, I prefer to use the term encountering it, 
is a mystical experience that belongs to the birthright of the human species. We are not just biological animals like all others. We do have particular capacities that other animals don't have. And one of those is the range of our imagination and the range of our capacity to have mystical and supernatural experiences. And so it's, I'm sure everyone listening right now has heard of illumination. Uh, Buddha means the illumined one. We've heard of illumination. We hear the metaphor of light, luminosity, and illumination. In almost every instance where some spiritual experience is described. Isn't that so? If you go back to the Vedas, they talk about the light. If you go back, you know, Buddha, as I say, means the one who sees the light. Oh, I saw the light. St. Teresa saw the light. Meister Eckhart saw the light. Mm -hmm. Timothy Leary saw the light, or whatever. What I want to point out to you who are listening now is that whatever you have heard about experiences of light in a mystical and spiritual awakening, this is completely unique and exceptional. I'm not discounting or dismissing what other people have said about experiences of the light, but I'm here to tell you that the experience of the organic light is something completely unique and exceptional. And it, it, as you consider it and hear my words and my personal testimony of of this experience, please bear in mind that it is something that needs to be distinguished from all other experiences of light. Why would that be so? Well, I'll give you a very simple reason. Look at the planets of the solar system. We know that the Earth is part of a solar system which has a sun as a central body, and then there are Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, and the other planets. As we understand the solar system from conventional science, we'll just let it, accept it for now as a provisional truth, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that the bodies in the solar system are not of themselves radiant. So, the sun is obviously radiant, pours out all this light, everybody can see that. Nobody is denying that. And then we see the light reflected in various ways. One of the ways that the light is reflected, the light of the sun is reflected off the moon. Sometimes you can go out. We're going to have a full moon on Friday here, maybe of mm -hmm. apocalyptic dimensions, some people are saying. <laughs> yeah. it's, going to, it's very close to the earth. The moon is at what it's called its perigee. It's going to be huge because it's very, very close to the earth. At times, the moon is further from the earth or closer to the earth. Anyway, everyone knows that you can go out on some full moon nights and sit and read a book because the reflection mm -hmm. of the sunlight from the moon is so brilliant. So we have, as science would have us believe, the stellar radiation of the sun pouring light into the solar system and then the reflected light of the moon. And we're also led to believe that you see in the sky, when you look up, you see points of light, and you see two different kinds. Most of those points of light are stars, like our sun, which are radiating light. But you also see the planets. But according to science, the planets don't radiate light. They are not... M uh, emanating, light emanating bodies. They do not mm -hmm. emanate luminosity. So when you see the planet Saturn or the planet Jupiter, which you can see with your naked eye, you're able to see it because the light of the sun is reflecting off those planets and reflects back to the Earth and it gives you an image of the planet. Okay, let's accept that as a provisional explanation. Now I can tell you why the experience of the organic light is so special. According to the understanding and learning of the mystery school teachers who are profound seers and shamans, the Earth is not like the other planets in the solar system. The Earth that we inhabit actually doesn't even belong 
to this solar system. This is in the Sophia myth. Mm -hmm. The Earth is a living entity, a, a planet of a living embodied divinity, where, by contrast to the other planets in our solar system, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, and so forth, which are largely inorganic worlds. I'm not denying, by the way, absolutely denying that they might not have the presence of some life forms in them. For instance, it's becoming pretty obvious that Mars has the presence of some life forms in it. But Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, any other planet in the solar system that you can name cannot be compared to the Earth. The Earth is incomparable because it is totally permeated with life. Mm -hmm. From the core right out to the surface right out to the atmosphere. It is totally permeated with life because she, Sophia, is the divine presence in this planet. And she is a cosmic goddess from the, from the galactic center. The Gnostics didn't just hypothesize this. They didn't just surmise that the earth might be through and through in every cell of its being alive. They knew it and they encountered it. And in that encounter, they recognized what science has yet to recognize. Mm -hmm. The earth emanates luminosity. It emanates a living light. What is the organic light? My friends, I am here to tell you with great happiness, it is the living luminosity of the planet Earth. It is alive. And no other planet in our solar system has this light. And no matter what mystical experiences of enlightenment or illumination you may have, fine. I hope they're exciting. I hope they're blissful. And I hope you learn from them. But the encounter with the organic light the living luminosity of Gaia Sophia, that's another story. And that is completely unique and exceptional. So I hope I've framed that up for you so that someone who maybe is coming to this for the first time would, would get how momentous this is. Mm -hmm. That's actually, yes, it's actually a wonderful um, introduction. And also, again, I mean, one that might allow us to really open into... Um, essentially speaking, the feeling possibility of that, if that makes any sense, not just thinking about what you've just said, but again, opening into the feeling of that as we kind of consider the, that we're living on and in this, this planet and this luminous field. So um, absolutely great introduction to that for folks who haven't joined us and even um, an expansion uh, for those who did listen to the third conversation. So now that you've given that amazing introduction to this living luminosity, this um, living light that's emanated the essence of um, Sophia herself, you know, embodied in and as this planet will open into this. It's, just, it's so amazing. It's so profound to me. I just have to take a moment and be with that. But um, <laughs> not, not, I know, it's like one of those things, <laughs> you know, I just really kind of sense into it, and then I have to remember that this is a radio show and we have to talk. But, <laughs> but well, the, we're, the, you know, we're go we're ahead. We're talking about Austin. We're talking about awesome things. This is awesome. It is, it is awesome to understand what this is. And I'll tell you, it's awesome just to hear about it. You can imagine mm -hmm. how awesome it is to be in its presence, you know, and mm -hmm. to be in the presence of the organic light and know what you're seeing. And this is what I want to underline. And as we continue this conversation, I want to tell you how you can know what you are seeing. To be in the presence of the organic light and know what you're seeing is the most sublime mystical experience of the human species. And it is, but it is also the birthright of every single human being. We are here to see and meet the goddess, the white goddess, as she's been called, in this light and in this encounter. This is the transcendent moment and the transcendent opportunity for our species, and it always has been. Why are the mysteries so special? 
Why are the pre-Christian pagan mystery schools so important? Is because they preserved this encounter. They were training schools and universities of initiation that led people to this encounter with the white goddess, the luminosity of the organic light, and we are now returning to it, and we will return to it, and we will find in it the knowledge of a sane and sustainable future for humanity, and we will find in it the bliss and the deathlessness of our own species, the deathlessness, because in the presence of that light, you are deathless. Mm -hmm. And this encounter is awesome, and so I, I am as awed by it today, talking to you, Jamie, as I have been all of my life from the first moment that I saw it when I was 19 years old in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that you had mentioned a little bit about that in the third um, conversation, the previous conversation on the Feminine Mojo Show, and, and you also write about it at metahistory.org. Um, and I'm going to actually uh, rearrange um, our questions a little bit because I want to make sure that um, we have uh, the um, time or use the time we have to share um, how, the, how people can begin to perceive the organic light and interacting with the organic light themselves, you know, how to begin bringing that into their own practice, their own awareness, their own experience. But first, um, how has your own experience with the organic light changed your perception and, um, and no doubt your life? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big one, huh? Yeah. yeah. How did it change my life? Uh, yeah, really. I mean, it made my life. Uh -huh. made my life. And uh, it, uh, it directed my life. You know, I've written a kind of a memoir on Metahistory Org, and in this memoir, which is called Severed Rose, um, and there are four parts. In this memoir, I've disclosed in writing more about the organic light than has ever, ever been written down. And I, what I have the honor and privilege to share with you now is to share in spoken words a lot of what I have said in that, that memoir. And uh, if I were to sum up my experience with the organic light, I would say that uh, throughout my life, the light came to me. It showed itself to me for the first time when I was 19 in Cambodia. I had absolutely no idea what it was. Uh, I can tell you that experience is as vivid to me as if it happened five minutes ago. Um, and from that moment on, the, uh, the, the light led me through a series of experiences in my life. The light actually led me to the point where I could speak of the light. I would put it in that way. The light in my life, the, my encounters with it, both with and without the trance induced by psychoactive plants, by the way, it's a very important point to make. You can be led to the organic light in a trance state induced by psychoactive plants, sacred plants like psilocybe mushrooms. You can also have it spontaneously. You can have it both ways, folks. <laughs> so mm -hmm. don't get caught up on that problem, okay? Don't make that a problem. But I've had it both ways. I've had it in sex, too. That's the third way to have it. And mm -hmm. when, when you in the bliss of sex, in the, in, the, in the dissolution, in the meltdown of sexual rapture, you can be brought into the presence of the organic light. So these are the ways that it can come to you. And throughout my life, I was shown by each experience of the light, I was shown how to describe it to people so that they would know exactly what it is. Uh, the, the point that I really want people to take away with them from this conversation with me now is that there is a responsibility in bringing yourself to the organic light. Mm -hmm. If you really want to know and meet Sophia in her divine luminosity and interact, you must be able to bring discernment to it. You must be able to have the parameters that will allow you to know what exactly this experience is and not to just 
to confound it or confuse it with other experiences of illumination or light. So in a sense, as I describe in Severed Rose, my entire life has been a process of developing a way to inform the world, if you will, what exactly are the parameters for experiencing and meeting this light and interacting with it. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, one question just came up. I know that we're the point of, or, or our hope in this conversation was to share some of the um, of the ways that that happens, and um, yeah. and in some in some cases, this is really for the this is for the first time. You know uh, mm-hmm. that that you're sharing this publicly, and I know the mystery um, teachings included very protected initiations into it, That's and right. you mentioned some of those um, in our last conversation, but what's so important about sharing this information now? Because, you know, John, it really does feel like it's time, you know, that to share it, to um, put the vibration out there through word, both spoken and written, so that those who are being called by that homing signal, if you will, can find it. But what, why is it so important to share this information now more broadly and more explicitly and clearly than it might have been, you know, back in the, the days when the mystery schools and the ancient times were alive and well? Well, in the mystery schools, they did not talk openly about the properties of the organic light as I have done. This was not done because of the sacred vow was taken. I would ask those of you who are attracted to this experience to go to metahistory.org and on the menu panel, click on Lydia's Well. And when you come into the site, a part of the site that is written by my colleague Lydia, you'll find a short piece there. It's only two and a half, three pages long, which is called Lydia's Vow. Mm-hmm. And that piece describes how in an ancient mystery cell in Antioch, which was Antalya of current uh, Turkey, Antioch was a very important city for the mystery schools mm-hmm. of the Levant. And there was a very well established and highly developed mystery cell there. And Lydia was a part of that cell. And she explains, in the manner of a past life recall, if you can accept that metaphor. She explains how the eight members of that cell met on an autumn day in the 4th century and they had a conversation. And in that conversation, they looked forward 1,600 years before now to where we are today because they were seers who could see into the future. They could not necessarily see the exact events that we're facing now, but they could see one thing really clearly. They could see that the human condition was going to become embroiled in lies and deception. And that society itself and human relations were going to be mm-hmm. clouded by lies and deceptions and corruption, which is the world as we know it today. Mm-hmm. And, and they recognized also a very tragic and devastating truth. They recognized that at the end of Kali Yuga, which is where we are now, 200 years from the end of Kali Yuga in 2216, that the condition of the human mind and spirit would be so degenerate that it would be impossible to tell truth from deception. It would be impossible to tell what was the truth. And particularly in regard to spiritual teachings Mm -hmm. of whatever kind you want, spiritual teachings about liberation and about the origin and purpose of the human species, that there would be enormous confusion and enormous deception. Scholars use the term for this phenomena that the mystery school adepts uh, of, of Lydia's cell previsioned. Scholars use this term desacralization. It's a, it's a term that means that the human species has become dissociated and disconnected from the sacred. And when we lose our connection with the sacred, which is the power by which we live, Mm -hmm. Gaia Sophia, we lose the touchstone for truth. 
because the sacred is the ultimate truth. And if we're desacralized, to use that academic term, we, we, we have lost the sense for the truth. And so what Lydia describes in her little piece is that the members of the mystery cell recognize the time ahead, which is our time now, mm -hmm. when every single thing that is sacred, every single truth that is sacred, would be violated and corrupted. And that's a terrible thing for them to foresee. Yeah. And in foreseeing that, in foreseeing that, and I believe they foresaw it accurately, they said, well, that will be the time when one of us, eight of us in this cell, will come forward, we will reappear in that time, and we will come forward and we will present to the world that which cannot be violated. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. organic light is that which cannot be violated. The experience of meeting the organic light can be mistaken, and I want to talk about that, how it can be mistaken. You can experience it, and perhaps people listening to me now have experienced it, but they mistook what they experienced. It can be mistaken, but it cannot be violated, it cannot be hijacked, it cannot be faked, it cannot be corrupted. Mm -hmm. So this experience of the organic light is, in a sense, the ultimate touchstone for our species to the truth of who we are and the truth of our purpose and our connection with Gaia, and that is why it is so tremendously important to describe this experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm feeling that. I'm feeling it coming through again. I mean, it's uh, it's incredibly um, powerful, and I also felt a recognition as you're talking about the uh, Lydia Sow and Lydia Cell. You know, uh, where we our recollection is activated to that um, perhaps that experience, that time, that knowing, that awareness. So that's always, you know, kind of a profound experience too when we when we um, register uh, that in a way that is beyond intellectual. It's it's almost like a remembering, you know, just as we would remember anything else. Yeah. So you um, remember, James. One function of the organic light is that it's not only the source of knowledge and learning and guidance, uh, but it also contains the memory banks of Gaia. Mm -hmm. memory banks of the goddess are in the organic light and I've been there many times I go to those memory banks this is what shamans do and this is not my invention if you read the traditional I understand. Yeah. profile of shamanism you know that don't you what is yeah. the role of a shaman in a tribe to remember the history of the tribe and to go in a trance state and access the, the what is called the phylogenetic memory the transpersonal memory. You can do this through the organic light. And you will remember who you were, you will remember what you were, and you will remember things that weren't even your own experience, yep. but were the generic experience of the human species. It's all available, and she brings it to us. And this is the time when we must remember who we were in order to know who we are and who we're mm -hmm. going to be. So let's go next to how does one begin to perceive the organic light, knowing this and knowing it's important and knowing that we are, you know, surrounded by it, held by it, embraced by it. It's right here. You know, it's that, it always reminds me of, you know, the kingdom of heaven is spread about you, but you don't have the eyes to see it. And, um, and I know that not all of us, um, perceive predominantly or first with our visual sense. You know, some people are kinesthetic, so they, you know, are more sensual first in their perception, right. and others might hear. So, um, right. and I, I don't know if that's as relevant with the organic light or, or whether it just presents so that we are all ultimately able to see it, or we might sense it first or hear it or know it. Um, but how do, how do we begin to perceive the organic light? Well, first of all, it is primarily a visual experience. Mm -hmm. You see it. You do not sense it or feel it or hear it. It has a, a very tremendous, powerful uh, oral properties, A-U-R-A-L, oral mm -hmm. sound properties, auditory properties. It has an auditory effect. It does speak to you. You can communicate with it in the language of your own thought. 
This is something that's very clear from certain passages in the Nagamani materials, which I've quoted. For instance, in the in the uh, paraphrase of Shem, I think it's called, uh, the light w- the the light was full of sound and hearing. This mm. is a testimony from the interior of the mystery schools. Paraphrase of Shem: The light was full of sound and hearing. I can tell you that that is exactly what it is. So, but primarily it is a a visual phenomenon. So let's talk about that and let's concentrate on that. Okay. So that I can get the best possible lead to this. The first thing that you need to know before you experience the light is that the organic light casts no shadow. Just think about that. Mm -hmm. This is also, there's very, very little surviving written testimony about the organic light because people were not permitted to do what I'm doing now. They were not permitted to talk about its actual properties. But one of its properties that did leak out was, uh, and you, you'll find this in, not in his image, and I know you know that, Jamie, because you read the mm-hmm. book about eight <laughs> times as far as I can tell. Uh, it's a living text with me, John. Right, right. I'm very happy to hear that, that there are ancient texts which say, and the non-commodity passages would say, it doesn't cast any shadow. Second thing you need to take on board is that it's soft. It's not a glaring, brilliant, blinding light. It's not hard. It's soft. It's like marshmallow. Mm -hmm. And it's like radiant marshmallow. If you can imagine anything like that. Mm -hmm. So... Three properties I want to give you. This is like to predispose your mind to the perception of this. Do you understand? Because when you perceive the organic light, the trick is to recognize that you are perceiving it. The the living luminosity of the earth that pours out of the pores of Gaia, it pours out of the pores of Gaia, is right in front of you right now. But you can't recognize it. Mm Mm-hmm. So you need to be prepared or briefed in order to recognize it. And what the secrecy of the mystery schools was about was not withholding any knowledge from humanity or Mm -hmm. some privileged or elitist position where they had access to things and they weren't going to give it back to the world at large. No, 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 no. That's entirely wrong. The position of the mysteries was that you only give the briefing to people who are going to then be taken to the light. Do not give the tale, details of the briefing out because it will queer the experience. The experience mm-hmm. of encountering the organic light is stunning, jaw-dropping, and spontaneous. Mm-hmm. And in order to bring people to the light, therefore the telestai or the initiates faced a very subtle problem. They needed to brief people about what they were going to see so that they could recognize it. On the other hand, they could not do that briefing in a too broad or general manner, or else people would have preconceptions and they would not be free for the spontaneous revelation of the light. Do do you understand that problem? I don't know if I'm getting that across. Yes, absolutely. I mean, because so often we'll look for something in the exact way that it's been um, told to us, and in doing that and being locked into that particular expectation, okay, it's going to look like this, et cetera, et cetera, we may actually be missing it because we're over-focusing on what we think it should be. Is that correct? That's right. There is a, there is a problem with a, conceptual pre, with a pre-conceptual approach to the organic light. And uh, I am facing that problem, and I thought a great deal about it. Mm-hmm. And I feel confident now that I can describe to you who are listening the exact properties of this light in such a way that the description is not going to get in the way of the moment that it comes, okay? Mm -hmm. So you collaborate with me on this. So I've given you two properties so far. This light does not cast a shadow, and it is soft. And there is, in addition to that, a third property. And this is really what is mind drop boggling and jaw-dropping when you see it. 
because we're not accustomed to this. What is light? What is the light that you ordinarily see? Well, you stand at the window of your house and you look out at the field in the sky and you see the earth in front of you. Why? Because light, which is transparent, is coming from the sun and it is shining on the earth. And so the light of the sun shows you the things it shines on. But you don't see the light of the sun itself, do you? Mm -hmm. Because it's transparent. It's clear, like gin. Third property. The light of the living presence of the earth comes out of the earth. It doesn't come through the sky. It doesn't even go through space at all. It doesn't go through space. It goes through (laughs) matter. Mm -hmm. goes through material things. And the best way that I can describe it, and here I reach the limits of my my description, the organic light is a soft, white, shadowless luminosity that wells up out of material things. It does not shine through space. It shines out of matter, out of mass. So these are the properties that will enable you to distinguish it when you see it. And in the ancient mystery schools, you know, they had a vetting process. Everyone could get into the mysteries. Slaves, emperors, rich, poor, merchants, dancers, artists, artisans, sailors, tailors, whatever you want. The mysteries were an egalitarian organization. But you could only enter the mysteries and the outer mysteries to a certain doorway. And then the telestai who could perceive the organic light, would scrutinize the people who had come into the mystery sanctuary. And they would take aside those who they believed could be led directly to the presence of the light. And then they debriefed them and prepared them in the way that I'm doing now. And they also used, not always, but they usually used a psychoactive potion in order to bring people to the presence of the light, simply because the way that you ordinarily perceive in your neurochemical brain processes creates a set of filters. And those filters are like gauze or like sunglasses in front of your eyes. They're, they're, They're actually polarized filters of a neurochemical origin. And they prevent you from seeing the organic light. So the purpose of, uh, because if you saw it all the time, <laughs> would be able to function because <laughs> it is so awesomely beautiful. Mm-hmm. So, so Faya herself has given us these brain filters so that we don't see it all the time. And the, and she's, but she's also given us the sacred plant medicines to drop those filters temporarily so that we can see it. You see, there's a deep science and a deep wisdom in all of this. So the, the mystery school teachers who saw the light were then able to bring other certain selective people to the experience of the light by telling them what I'm telling you now. Okay. So whether, and I, I know that there were wheat substances and other um, sacred substances used and um, also right. that you've mentioned and others have experienced that you can drop into um, non-ordinary states of seeing or perceiving to be able to see the organic light or the luminosity emanating from the planet, from Gaia Sophia. And um, so what else would you um, share with us about um, now that you've shared the three per, the three elements three or facets? Right. Those are the three main properties. There are also other properties that are very important to understand so that you do not mistake this experience of the light. You cannot take it for anything else. Mm-hmm. It is completely exceptional. There are other properties, and you can read about them in Severed Rose. Okay, let me just sum up. What did the teachers and seers in the mystery schools do themselves to receive the organic light? Mm -hmm. They used psychedelic potions like the potion of fermented barley at at Eleusis, Mm -hmm. which is now known to be an LSD-like concoction. 
because fermented barley has uh, that fungus on it, the fungus of ergot, which is the basis of LSD. Pretty much common knowledge these days. They use psilocybin mushrooms. They use trance, dance. They use music. They use mudra, trance dance. They dance themselves into the perception of the organic light, dance themselves into non-ordinary states, and they used sex. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the really good sex, which is the real surrender and melt, it's the melt of sex. And you melt into complete surrender because it feels so good. That state is also the threshold of non-ordinary perception. And you can perceive and glimpse the organic light through exquisite and ecstatic sexual experiences, sexual encounters. This is the way they did it. Now let's come up to our time. How are we going to do it today? How are we going to approach and perceive the organic light today? Well, it would be possible still, and I've done this to a certain degree, very limited cases, it would be possible for a telestis who, who can perceive the light consistently, such as myself, to take other people to that encounter. I've done that with only three people so far. Uh, that is possible, and that kind of follows the ancient model. To do that, I do use a psychoactive substance, because as I said, these substances were provided by Gaia herself to temporarily low, lower our filters, okay? That could be done, and, you know, I, not only I could do that, but anyone who has the practice of telestic shamanism with Gaia and who knows how to consistently go back to the organic light over and over again could lead other people to it in that way. So the old doorway of the old method is still open. I have to say, however, that that's not easy to do. The mm -hmm. conditions for that are not, are not particularly ideal, and that's why I haven't done it more than I have. First of all, I don't have people come and ask me to do it very much, mm -hmm. and some of them who have asked me to do it couldn't handle it. Yeah. You know, so it's complicated. But that is an option. Let's leave that open. Mm -hmm. Let's call that the hierophantic option, okay? Because the hierophant in the pagan mysteries meant the telestis, the veteran seer who could lead other people to the perception okay. of the light. Let's leave that open. I think, however, that there are other opportunities that are much more powerful and becoming much more prevalent now. I strongly feel since I received the term of Guy Awakening in 2008, that we are entering a moment when more and more people spontaneously experience the organic light. It can happen in dreams. This is one way. This is one pathway of approach. In fact, I've had a couple of people write me and saying that they have experienced something in their dreams and asked me what it was, and I wrote back and said, well, mm -hmm. I think that you are being led to the organic light. Someone actually dreamed of a woman in white flowing robes. You're going to experience something white. You're going to experience the white goddess in your dream. You're going to experience a white animal, like the white lions of Kimba mm -hmm. It'll be an animal or a woman. It won't be a man. Okay. It can be also other things, a white serpent. Maybe even insects, spiders, mm -hmm. white spiders. You know, these apparitions, these epiphanies are going to be happening because the collective unconscious, the collective psyche is blowing open. The catastrophe and the fear and the terror in our midst mm -hmm. is so intense that it is blowing the collective psyche wide open. The downside of that is that a lot of people are going to go insane and lose it. Yeah. You can see that all around. Yeah. The upside of it is, the upside is that is what Stan Groff calls a spiritual emergency. And in the spiritual emergency, you're going to awaken to an empowerment 
with the goddess, and you're going to awaken to her presence. So dreams is one thing. People who perceive the organic light in moments of contemplation, not so much meditation. I don't honestly believe you're going to get there through any existing form of meditation. Excuse me. I have to be brutally honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to get there through contemplation, which is to say, if you are out in nature, if you are looking at the sky and the earth and allowing your gaze to float outward, allowing mm-hmm. yourself to feel the simple, sweet embodiment, the simple, sweet embodiment of being alive, it will come to you. I am have occasionally people write me, say, I think I saw something in the sky, I think I saw something looking at this rock, looking at this river, that the organic light was starting to reveal it. So they are in nature and it will we will have these epiphanies. I am yeah. convinced that they are all taking place. Now, one thing I just might add and to your response to this Jamie, so we can be interactive here. If you go to Seven Rows and you go to uh, number three or four, there are four installments, you will see where I talk about the so-called plaster effect. Plaster, P-S-T-E-R. Now, this is actually an exercise you can do to predispose yourself to perceive the organic light. It's an exercise I used for many years and I described when I was in Arc, which is near Rennes-le-Château in southern France, the whole Mary Magdalene uh, scenario unfolded. When I was in Arc, by using the plaster effect, I was able to state my experience of the organic light. I have a stable perception of it. It's not erratic. I can perceive mm-hmm. it not exactly at will, but when I can stabilize the perception, it's an extremely subtle perception, Jamie. Yeah. Subtle. It doesn't jump out at you. You have to see it in a very subtle way. And if you have the plaster effect, you will understand that this is one way that can dispose you or prepare you for the encounter with the organic light. But I, I believe in my heart of hearts, and I... I believe in my mind of minds that this experience comes spontaneously to more and more people and very rapidly as, as we speak. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really a matter of also our awakening awareness, you know, where we're um, aware of this possibility and sort of opening our eyes, if you will. You know, I know as I listen to you, I mean, in my own perception or experience, there are times where I'll spontaneously see that emanating from something that just seems extraordinarily bright, you know, sometimes. I mean, it might be a geranium or something like that, but also um, in the evening, if I sit outside and soften, um, there's a perception then as well where it's almost like a blanket, you know what I mean? And there is a, a real sweetness, and um, I'm just becoming more and more aware of that. So given that listeners have heard what you've shared so far and have a growing um, awareness of what you're speaking of when you're talking about the organic light and, and um, perceiving that and how one might open to um, perceiving that. And I'm, you know, I'm assuming, too, that whenever we, you know, there are all of the, the, there's guidance in the scripture, too, and some of the sacred texts about, you know, when we start to ask that that question or have a very heartful um, yearning for an awareness or for this connection um, that we may well open to it. It's that sort of, you know, we take one step toward the divine, the divine takes a thousand steps towards us. Is that is that your um, perception of the organic light and, and people um, who might just be hearing this or, or recognize that this is something they've already had a yearning for, held in holding in question, but maybe not um, to the point where they've been able to put these words to it, is there something of power in that intention and that heartfelt yearning or putting the question out, this um, real desire to connect with this luminosity and living essence of Gaia Sophia? 
Sure, sure there is. I, I uh, really like the way you're articulating this. You give me uh, the perfect opportunity to make another point about being receptive to the light. There's a saying in, in Gayan Tantra, Planetary Tantra, Dakini instruction, mm-hmm. that goes like this. Disposition is the mother of intent. This is a really simple sentence of just a few words, seven or eight words. It's a very profound practice. comes along with this disposition is the mother of intent. There is a way to apply this Dakini teaching to the organic light. And I think that of all the approaches we've considered here, Jamie, this might be the best one and the most effective, might produce the best results for people listening. What do we mean by disposition? In the Sanskrit word, bhava, B-H-A-V-A, disposition. Well, let's say that I decide one day that I will learn how to paint watercolors. Mm-hmm. Okay? At the moment that I decide that, I feel a desire, I feel a longing. You use these words, they are the accurate words. I feel a longing, a desire. And at that moment that I could initially conceive that I want to learn, that I want to paint in watercolors, I have a disposition. But I do not have an intent. Because it will only remain a disposition if I don't act on it. Mm-hmm. Now, if the next day or the next week I go to the office supply store and I buy some watercolors and I buy a couple of and I uh, bring those home and sit down with them, then my disposition has moved to the realm of intent. Disposition is the mother of intent. Mm-hmm. So, Question, the, the, the way for everyone to proceed here who would like to have this sublime experience is first to really tell yourself that you have this disposition. Mm-hmm. I have the disposition to encounter the organic light. I use the word encounter, by the way, because you do encounter it. You don't just see it. You mm-hmm. meet it. And formulate that disposition in your mind. Locate it in your emotion. And then... Make it the supreme disposition of your life. It's not just, oh, yeah, well, this sounds fascinating, right. and that would be pretty <laughs> awesome, you know, and I would, yeah, oh, maybe I would like to do that, and I would also like to go down to the mall and see, you know, the latest film with Brad Pitt, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, no way, folks, no way. I'm here to tell you that if you want the supreme experience, of humanity, you make it your supreme disposition, like mm-hmm. for like. Yeah. So you make it the supreme disposition of your life that you want to do it, and then you translate it into intention. Now that's really interesting. How would you do that? How would you translate the disposition to meet your organic life into mm-hmm. intention? <clears throat> well, planetary tantra is a really fantastic practice. It is unlike any other practice that has existed on this earth before. This is a practice of interactive magic with Gaia. Mm -hmm. This opportunity that we have today, Planetary Tantra. And Planetary Tantra has certain components, and one of them, ritual actions. But the rituals of Planetary Tantra are not like any other rituals that have pre-existed in religious, uh, in religious movements or uh, in spiritual movements. If you go and you look at religion in the, in the Vedas, among the, uh, excuse me, at ritual practiced by the Vedas and the Brahmins who are still living today, if you look at the practice in the Catholic Church, the rituals practiced in an ayahuasca, uh, ceremony of the of the uh, ayahuasca churches in South America. If you look at a ritual practice, um, even in the American Indian traditions, you will find that these rituals are all kind of formal and staged. The rituals of planetary tantra 
are spontaneous actions of pleasure. They are not staged. And so one of the rituals that can be conducted in this manner is the ritual of courting. Courting is the ritual of going out in nature, finding a tree that has low branches, branches that you can reach without climbing the tree. Mm -hmm. Or it may be a tree that you can actually kind of inside the branches of the tree. You can nestle yourself inside. It can't be an evergreen because evergreens have too many, too thick of a foliage and have the needles are too thick. It ought to be a deciduous tree. And courting is a ritual in which you go and you enter colored cords in the branches of a tree. Mm -hmm. This is the primary ritual, one of the primary rituals of planetary tantra, and it's an interactive magic. It's a form of interactive magic with Gaia. Why am I bringing this up now? Because the rule is what you use to translate disposition to intention. Mm-hmm. Now, if I have a disposition to paint watercolors, I translate it to intention by going out and buying the supplies and buying the books. But if I have the disposition to organic light, I translate it into intention by a ritual of courting, a ritual of taking colored string and going out and putting it into the limbs of trees. And there's no particular formula to do this. You just do it so that you have a good time doing it and it looks beautiful. That's how simple it is. This is the first time I've spoken about this, by the way. Mm -hmm. I haven't talked about the rituals of planetary tantra. I would love to talk about them. But I want you to understand that my first introduction, I don't know if it's awkward or if it's... Uh, if it's... Uh, clear and instructive what I'm saying, that the rituals that you will perform to translate your disposition to intention are incredibly simple. They're not, they're not pious, orchestrated rituals. They're rituals of spontaneity and beauty, but they do achieve a, a fantastic purpose. The purpose of a ritual such as courting is that you express to Gaia herself your intention to see her light. By doing such a ritual in a tree, by winding cord around the trunk of a tree, you don't even have to go into the more elaborate forms of cording, which are shown on Meta History Org if you want to look at them. Just take a colored, two feet of colored yarn and go and wrap it in a spiral around the trunk of a tree. But do that with the intention of leaving a message to Gaia that you want to meet her light. And she will respond to your intention. Mm, that's really beautiful. Uh, you know, it's, what's really funny is that it brought back to my recollection something that I did when I was a small child and would go escape like a feral into the woods um, above the house and there was a particular tree that <laughs> I had this regular relationship with and conversations with and, you know, this great love for. It, it just brought that back to me so clearly. And, of course, we do these things naturally and are kind of guided away from them. So perhaps for many people um, also they will find themselves as they um, reach out with this, this to cultivate this disposition and reach out through um, loving, uh, intentional rituals to sort of leave those messages for Gaia Sophia herself to respond to in, in um, the invitation to see or encounter her light. But um, I, I wonder if people will begin to remember, you know, boy, there's something about this that seems very familiar. You know, when I was a child, I... You know, it's, it's something that seems like it might be very natural to us before we're literally taught away from it. It is natural, and it's innate to us. And one of the great pleasures of performing these simple rituals is that you feel so connected to something in yourself, to an innate knowing mm -hmm. uh, that has been oppressed and forgotten. 
it is natural and spontaneous to do these rituals, and they are natural and spontaneous. They're not like, you know, the ritual of the Mass of the Catholic Church, for instance, is, is a big deal. It's a big, pious orchestration of gestures and movements that have been pre-programmed and pre-planned. Uh, uh, and, mm -hmm. and the spontaneous rituals of Gayan Tantra are not like that at all. You do them out of the complete beauty and uh, playfulness of the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really, really work. Because the one thing that I can tell you from experiences of interactivity with Gaia so far is that she responds to gesture more than anything else. Gesture, you know, the Sanskrit word being mudra. Uh, one time when I was up on uh, Infinity Ridge, which is a place where I go to practice uh, telestic shamanism, is, uh, I was up there and I was having my initial lenses of talking to Gaia, actually getting her attention and talking to the planetary mother animal. Uh, because you can talk to her just like you could talk to me mm -hmm. or any other human being. And I noticed that I could communicate with her verbally. It's a telepathic communication. I don't hear some, you know, sexy feminine voice calling to me out of the undergrowth. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> I don't hear, you know, well, maybe, but that wouldn't be her, you know, that would be something else. Uh, I, you don't hear a voice outside your head. You hear it in the silent or subvocal language of your mind, but it is so distant, so clear that you cannot mistake it for your own mind. It is obviously a resonance within your mind of another mind that is present there. And, but I also noticed that when I felt that my words in the telepathic communication with Gaia at first was a little bit uh, shaky, precarious, I signed. I signed to her. Mm -hmm. You know, like you do with people who are deaf and dumb. Yeah. It was absolutely amazing. I formed a, something that I wanted to say to Gaia. When you talk to Gaia, you have to form your thoughts very clearly. You can't ramble or be vague. You have to have very still clear language. So I, I formed something that I wanted to say to her, just maybe a sentence of 20 words, but crystal clear. And then rather than saying it aloud or saying it in my mind, I signed it to her with my gestures. Mm -hmm. And that was a tremendous experience, let me tell you. I can't tell you. I can't describe what that was like. Uh, the, her response to you will put you down in your body like you have never been. You think you live in your body now. You ain't even mm -hmm. begun to live in your body until you live there with her. She will put you down in your body. You will feel what it is to be in your body, but your body is awake. Your body is awake like an instrument. It's awake like a violin, like a cello, like a piano. It's like a piano is awake when, it's, when someone's playing rock mud and off on it. That's how you feel. She returns her attention to you by deeply embodying you into her own circuits. And this is an ecstatic experience, but it's totally sober. You do it alive, awake. You do an out-of-the-body experience. This is an in-body experience. And one other thing that I, that I would say uh, and I, I want to add a little bit of a caution here in a moment, but the one thing that I don't want to forget to add is that you know that you are coming into the proximity of the light when you feel awe and rapture. Yep. That's it. And this is described in also in some of the mystery texts that survive in the non commodity experience. When you feel awe and rapture, you are in awe and rapture in your body, in the presence of our light. And I don't know, I cannot speak 
for anybody else, I will just speak from my heart to the heart of people listening. What is the most beautiful thing you have ever seen? What is the most beautiful moment you have ever had? The encounter with an organic light is the most beautiful thing you will ever have. And the beauty of it is obliterating. It obliterates your sense of separation. Mm -hmm. It obliterates everything that separates you from a complete source of everlasting life. It obliterates you in beauty and is breathtaking. And you want more and more of it. And I can't tell you how many times, honestly, I'm telling you, naked honesty, and I'm not holding anything back. I would die right then and there. Mm -hmm. I would die in that beauty and not blink an eye. Well, that's, um, it's certainly something I know that um, either people listening uh, will recognize or begin to recognize if they've had moments um, where that perception or that feeling um, has come in and uh, also gives more of a sense an experiential sense, a gnosis of um, what it might be like to court and invite and open to an encounter with the organic light, you know, that is the living luminosity, the very living essence of the planetary being herself. And, um, and also, John, it makes it really, really clear that it's experiential, you know, that it's mm -hmm. a, a matter of our own personal gnosis where we open to it, we take those actions, cultivate that disposition, um, form that intention by, um, you know, our openness to expressing these spontaneous gestures of love, really, um, an invitation to Sophia Gaia to express our own desire and yearning to connect with or to be aware of, because we're always connected with, but we're just not aware of, um, her presence and her essence and her intelligence and her love. And so that kind of, um, we've got about 25 minutes um, before our show today will end, but, you know, when, uh, as people um, who are so-called, you know, those of us who are so-called to continue cultivating or open to and begin cultivating this relationship, this new um, awareness of in this relationship with Gaia Sophia and the organic light. What have you experienced? You know, we talked a little bit, John, and you've mentioned too that, you know, this is in, a, in addition to so many other things, this um, full sensory experience, the beauty of it. Um, you mentioned that there's also an intelligence that can guide. And you mentioned in one of the previous conversations a bit more specifically what some of the Telestean mystery initiates um, experienced in that regard. But that seems to me also to be a really important point because as you kind of, we kind of, uh, I laughed a little bit and you mentioned before that this isn't really a matter of spirit attainment, you know, like <laughs> just sort of something that you'll add to your to-do list, you know, go to workshop, <laughs> you know, do courting That's ritual. Right. You know what I mean? That's right. I mean, there's an earnestness, right. there's a seriousness, a reverence, because there's something in us that really awakens and recognizes and calls us to that, you know. But, um, but what, you know, there is that intelligence and that guidance, and that to me seems, um, there's both the experience of it, which is transformative and emanates into the collective, and then this wisdom, this guidance that we have access to that might be shared with us, to bring into, you know, this world that seems to me to be very much in need of it. So can you say a little bit more about that, the, the guidance, the intelligence, you know, why um, it might be important for us to understand that there's the memory of the planet, there's the, uh, the memory of things we've forgotten. Can you share a little bit more about that? I'd love to. Uh, you, you bring up uh, really... Um some some key issues, some key parameters that 
can be helpful in the approach to this experience. I noticed with the light, Jamie, that you keep using the word invitation. Mm-hmm. Um, I love this word invitation. I love it. Uh, it's seductive. It's mm-hmm. exciting. You know, the best love, the best pleasure between man and woman comes by invitation, you know. It's great to be invited. <laughs> and yeah. It's great to invite, you know. This is what we love to do. And I've been saying to people lately, when I get a chance to talk in 3D about pleasure tantra, which is not often, um, pleasure tantra is an invitation game. Mm-hmm. It's all about invitation. Invite Gaia to come to you and reveal her organic light. Invite yourself to that experience. Invite yourself to the banquet of rapture. You know, invite yourself to be obliterated by beauty. Mm-hmm. Invite yourself. Inviting is a beautiful, beautiful concept because in a way it is, in a, it is a statement of intention, but it's also a statement of surrender. Mm-hmm. And in the balance between intention and surrender is really where this guy and magic happens. So that's a beautiful approach that you're making. Um, as far as the qualities, you know, a question that's been asked me one time, I guess, or maybe I just imagined. <laughs> You've um, received it so telepathically. Now, right, I, I may have received it telepathically. Well, what does the experience of love have to do with encountering the organic light? Mm-hmm. You know, do you, John, you, you, you say that you've encountered the organic light spontaneously and uh, somewhat erratically through your life at first. You say that you gradually put it together, that you were able to know what this light was, and now you can confidently describe it to other people so that they do not mistake the experience. So tell us, uh, you know, would you, do you feel overwhelming love pouring from Gaia when you experience the organic light? Honestly, no. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that love is absent from that experience. Far from it, okay? Mm-hmm. But it is not, as it were, a spiritually overwhelming moment when you are suddenly blown away by your unconditional love. Yeah. It's not that. It's not. I'm not discounting that experience, and I wish it to everyone who could have it. I've had it a few times myself. There are actual spiritual experiences where your heart is blown open, and you realize that the fundamental basis of everything is unconditional love. I've had those experiences, and they are wonderful. But that is not exactly what happens when you encounter the organic light. So if I can qualify it again a little bit more deeply. Don't forget that her name is Sophia, or Sophia, if you want to call her that. I call her Sophia. Don't forget that her name is Sophia. And what does it mean? Wisdom. That's her quality. That's what she named wisdom by the Gnostic seers when they gazed into the Theromic center, the core of our galaxy. And they looked back at the origin of the earth and the human species. Why did they call this energy, this divine star light, plasma luminosity, animated and animating, this animal power. Why did they call it Sophia? Because they recognize that her main quality is wisdom. So what you experience when you encounter the organic light is, first of all, a wellspring of wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's jaw-dropping. You realize that you could learn and know anything you want to know directly from the source. She is a fantastic teacher. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened. Pam, the planetary animal mother, is a fantastic, fantastic teacher. And this is what the uh, secret of the mysteries was all about. The uh, celesti, those who were guided by their experience of Gaia, came out from the mystery schools and they taught 
everything to the ancient world. They were the teachers and educators. They taught literacy, beekeeping, navigation, astronomy, astrology, sacred dance, alchemy, healing, woodworking, clayworking, writing, music. They taught everything. But they did not tell the people that they taught how they themselves acquired that fantastic knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. They acquired it from her, from this direct experience. And so the primary thing that you feel, that you detect when you're in the presence of the organic light is a wellspring, a fountain of infinite wisdom. And then as you stand there in the presence of it and you interact with it, you let it, to, let it to permeate you. You let the texture of the light come to you and touch your skin. And it feels like melon on your skin. Mm-hmm. It, it, this, this light is substantial, my friends. This light is a substance. It is not an empty void of luminosity. It is a substance that touches your skin. When you feel this cellular awakening in this interaction she the wisdom goddess awakens in you the very divine endowment that she put into you and into Mm -hmm. our species and so it's an interaction of learning and wisdom that is primarily what it is but you cannot possibly exclude love from this exchange Mm -hmm. any student any young person or older person who's had the opportunity to be in a classroom with a literature, knows that love happens in that classroom as well because you just love the teacher and you love what you're learning. You love what you're learning. So it's not a, transfer, it's not a personal kind of love. You don't feel that, like, oh, Gaia Sophia loves me, you know, and I love her. It's not like that at all. It's much, much bigger than that much bigger, but the mm-hmm. quality of love is there. The quality of love is there, but I would say that the three resonant properties, the three spiritual and emotional properties, you could say, of this encounter are first, this radiant, infinite store of wisdom that pours mm-hmm. toward you. Second, the obliterating beauty of it. It's like put you to your knees. It is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then the love of this experience, you cannot help but love it. And you cannot help but love yourself for the innocence and purity in which you stand before that light. Mm -hmm. When you stand before that light, you are like the first human being that ever did or the last. Mm-hmm. So, I know, and I know that we've um, spoken about this before, and uh, we have about ten minutes remaining. So, why? I mean, I know that the mystery teachers obviously felt like it was incredibly important to have this conne- connection and relationship and encounter with the organic light because they did bring so much forth from this incredible well of wisdom and shared it with um, with people and then also shared the initiation with those that they perceived um, would be able to receive it and and also handle it rightly. You know, because there was, as you mentioned before, yeah, we talked before that there was a real sort of an integrity that anything received in these encounters would be brought forth to support the liberation and, um, you know, remembrance, if you will, of the divine endowment in people, right? And the the liberation from that which which constricts us, yeah. So that's, Mm -hmm. that's always kind of really profound for me, you know, when I touch into that incredible... Um, ethic or integrity for using this information, sharing this information for the liberation of others and for the upliftment and the recollection of these divine gifts and our divine endowment, which of course benefits everyone. But um, why was it then and why is it now um, so important to 
have this connection and relationship with Gaia Sophia in this way, with this living luminosity, this essence that is the the being, the intelligence, the light of the planetary being, Sophia herself. Why is that so important right now? I would say first and foremost, Katie, that the reason why this is so important now is because the species has lost its way. We're going off course. We are not beings created in God's image. We are not the subjects and the creation of some male paternal deity who stands off planet and lays down the rules of how we should live. I don't mean that we've gone off course in the sense that we have not obeyed the rules and commandments of the Father God. Not at all. We have got off course because that we have become alienated from the living presence of the divine right here on Earth. Forget about the cosmos. Forget about all the other stars. Forget about the billions of universes out there. If we don't find it here, we're not going to find it anywhere. Mm-hmm. And we have been ripped out of that connection. And as a result, human, the human species can now claim its divine endowment can no longer fulfill its divine potential. And unless we correct that situation, we're finished as a species. Mm-hmm. You know, there are two ways that Gaia can complete her experiment. She has choices beyond what humans have. I would love to complete her divine experiment and carry it to its beautiful, the most beautiful levels of actualization with the human species and that option is open but she can also do it without us she can do it both ways we however can't do it without her and so the most important reason to connect with the organic light and re the mysteries but even do things that they couldn't do in the mysteries to become interactive magically with Gaia, the reason is to correct our own behavior, to correct the way we live, and to get the divine experiment back on course. And not made in God's image. We are creatures in the imagination of the goddess. That is a statement of correction. And you can put it on your fridge. You know, <laughs> we are I hope you do. I wish you would. You know? Uh-huh. Put that on the, on the post-it note on the uh, bathroom mirror. Put that on the bathroom mirror. We are create, co-creators and subjects in a divine experiment. We are the product of divine imagination. We live in her dream, but we are behaving like we live in the nightmare of our own making. Mm-hmm. And the only way, the only way, to correct that is to reconnect. In order to correct, we reconnect. And the best way to reconnect with her is through the organic light. You know, I want to add this, and I wouldn't feel that I had done an adequate job in our, not a job, it's my pleasure, but I wouldn't feel that I had done an adequate uh, presentation in this interview when I had this. I am an extremely privileged person in what I have been able to experience in my life. But the privilege that I enjoy of discovering the organic light, having had it shown to me at 19 from the forehead of a Cambodian girl, and all I've gone through through the 40 or more years of my life to make this available is is a great privilege, but my privilege is everybody's privilege. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be thought of as the privilege of one person. This is our birthright. This is our birthright. If you really want to claim your humanity, this is where you claim it. It's the deepest level. Mm-hmm. And everything unfolds from there. Our correction of our behavior, the healing of the gender split, the healing of our human insanity, and the, and the path of interactive magic with Gaia. This, this is where it comes from. This is the source. 
That's incredible, John. Thank you. And we're um, just now going to wrap up. Um, so I know we've mentioned several times already that um, listeners can find some of what you've been sharing in written form at metahistory.org. Will you just um, mention again uh, the various places they might look? I know you mentioned Lydia's Well, and then there's, is it the Severed Rose at metahistory.org? Right. First thing I would suggest is to go to the home page. There's a menu panel. You'll see Lydia's Well. Click, and you'll see Lydia's contributions, and click on Lydia's Vow. It's only two and a half pages long. Mm -hmm. And then you can either go to the search function on the home page and, and uh, put in organic light, and then you'll find the many references to it in the site. Or else you can go to Severed Rose, S-E-V-E-R-E-D, -E -E S-E, and there are four installments of Severed Rose. It's under the Tantric. It's under the Terma section of Planetary Tantra. And that describes at length and in great detail how I initially encountered the organic light and how I have come to um, the manner of describing it that I've, I'm sharing with you here this mm -hmm. evening. Beautiful. Thank you. And, um, and so thank you once again. I'll, I'll wrap up in just a moment, John, but I want to... Thank you so um, deeply from the core cells of my being for joining me in this conversation. It's, it's such a wonder, and I have such deep appreciation for it. And I'm so grateful to be able to share it with some um, others who have been listening live or find this and listen to the um, audios in the archives. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing what has come through you and sharing what's come to you in your experience. Well, it's really um, a great pleasure and a lovely, a lovely experience for me as well. Very good. And uh, thank you, listeners, too. Um, you can find more, again, uh, about John and some of the work he's mentioned in this series at metahistory.org. And you can find more about opening into the recollection of your own feminine gifts through a variety of modes, and also supporting and awakening some of the sensitivities that um, can support you in this great invitation to and with Gaia Sophia to experience and open into an encounter with the organic light and your own wellspring of wisdom. And you'll find information on that in the other Feminine Mojo projects, the Feminine Mojo Mystery School at www.ivysea.com. And it looks like, you know, wait for it and look for the announcements, but it looks like, it looks like we might have uh, another conversation um, with John and me about this gender split, what caused it, what's the history of it. It's always great to know our history and also um, how and why it's important to heal this gender split. It's something that I feel um, deeply committed to and called to as well. So, again, watch the announcements for the Feminine Mojo Show. Uh, either follow on Twitter or Facebook or um, subscribe to the Sophia's Children blog, and you'll get the announcements for the Feminine Mojo Shows. And you can join me, too, on March 30th, and Melissa Gale West will be joining me to talk about the subject of transformation, the transformations that we have been going through, are going through, and their um, connection with the initiation paths in some um, and many indigenous cultures where there was an awareness of that that we've lost, but um, how seeing it through that hero-heroine's journey, uh, an initiation into higher spiritual awareness, or at least the opportunity for that exists for us as we um, face and move through some of these challenges and transformations and dark nights of the soul. So that's March 30th. That's Melissa Gale West. I'll be putting out the announcements for that as well. And um, as always, I am so greatly appreciative that you've chosen to spend this time listening with us here in the Feminine Mojo Show. Take care and be very, very well, all of you.